Well, I've got, I've got a legend here. I, I don't know when we last spoke. It seems yonks ago, Josh. <laughs> and and a lot lots happened this year for sure. Um, yeah. So yeah, welcome and um, hope you hope you're good. Are you? Yeah. No. Fine. Thank you. Um, yeah. It has been a wee while. Good to be back on. Yeah. Nice one. Okay. Cheers. Uh, yeah. I, the topic uh, mental health. It. it um, it it seems it seems definitely a reality and and people are talking about it. Um, perhaps not so much in motorsport, Josh. Um, and I don't see any reason why it shouldn't be discussed. Um, maybe from from the standpoint of um, pressure, uh, mental pressure, um, and 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 how you you dealt with it as as a writer in your career. Uh, perhaps that can be something that others can relate to just yeah, as they're, as they're starting up and, um, yeah how did you deal with it Josh uh, I guess for me um, I obviously the only thing I ever knew was racing so you just kind of got used to it uh, as far as you have pressure as a kid that you put on yourself to try to be successful and then as you um, as you got older, there became more pressure from a result standpoint, um, obviously more money involved, and then, of course, you needed a better result. So, look, I, I was pretty good with it, and as I said to you earlier, um, I probably am a little bit boring on this, on this sense because I was very fortunate to be quite strong mentally in the space of, of the pressure, um, and I don't really know why. I think... Uh, I think it was hard for me to become successful as a writer. I wasn't extremely talented. So when I finally got there, um, it was almost like anything was was good. Um, of course, you had pressure to re achieve results. But at the same time, I always was mindful that I was doing what I loved and enjoyed. So, And I was also mindful that I was fortunate to be doing what I was doing. So obviously, different times the pressure came on. When I noticed the pressure mostly was towards the end of my career because I always wanted to be world champion and I got close quite a few times and and fell short so that was one pressure point and the next one was life after racing um, I'd been a motorcycle rider at that point for 25 28 years so and and about 15 to 20 years of that had been as a professional so I didn't know a lot else other than riding motorbikes so that was Probably after racing was the most um, pressure part of, of my career, um, so to speak. So how did I deal with that? Um, as I said, realised that I was fortunate to be where I was, um, tried to enjoy it as much as possible and looked to other people um, and, and what had happened to them in their careers or, or their direction they were taking or... Um, also organisation. So everyone's a little bit different, I guess. But for me, um, being very organised helped me because it, 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 it meant that I was prepared for life after racing and also prepared uh, in order to get the result, which helped, um, or, or whatever it may be. Organisation was, was definitely, for me personally, uh, a, good, a good factor in trying to re relieve that pressure. Okay. Um, just just relating that to like the writers today, I'm thinking of Dylan Walsh. Um, yeah. Like he he would be for me, you know, he he was British champion, you know, MX champion and MX2 last year, and then it didn't quite switch over when he hit the the GPs. Josh, do you think it was um, that mental adjustment of he was more in his comfort zone on the British soil than he was at the GPs? Oh, 100%. No doubt about it. Um, mm. And that's not only for him. That's for a number of riders. And that was the same for me when I got over there. I spent the first three years just riding around and not riding to my potential to the point where it was nearly all over. Um, and I, I had the potential, but I just couldn't unleash that. And it wasn't until I matured yeah. enough that I could. So no different than him. Um, I talk about I talked to this I talked about this, sorry, to Jay Wilson recently. Um, he won the world eighty-five championships when it was in Telpo and 
all those riders he raced with at that point are now at the top of MXGP. And I said to him, if you stayed in that industry and kept, and went back to Europe and stayed there and kept developing and riding, you too would be up there. I have no doubt about it. You had the skill. It's just more the mental um, strength on, I guess, the support and the mental attitude to be able to stay there and sustain it. And then before long, you can um, you get sucked along in that system and your speed develops and it's no different for dylan unfortunately for him the pressure is probably coming more so from not being able to potentially or not having a ride for the for the next season um running out of time where am i going to go i'm getting older i need to make money um i'll put everything into this what's the next step so that is what probably plays on the mind rather than focusing on the on the job at hand and, and getting the results. But as I said at the start, definitely mental pressure and definitely not showing his full potential uh, because of it. Yeah. I mean, there's a flip side to the coin, Josh, you know, like I reckon he's handled 2020 brilliantly, you know, like he was in pretty much where do I go from here in March? And, um, you know, he got a whole shot, a couple of whole shots at, at, at the latest GPs. Is there, you know, is there a deja vu somewhere in there, Josh, that these guys, you know, actually need to go perhaps to that point where of no return and think, how, you know, I either do it now or I don't? Yeah, well, I like, uh, I like his attitude around, around that. I mean, he left New Zealand um and you know with a packed gear bag and and almost landed a pro circuit uh, mx2 ride in america came very very close to getting that um then landed something in the uk did really well at his first race and then all of a sudden was picked up a, a fill-in ride at mxgp so i mean that's pretty cool that he was able to do that um and you know if you have that flexibility and are able to to travel and, and and go and do that, then those opportunities do come up and uh, put yourself in a good position and good things happen. So there's a lot of positives there. Um, I guess the negatives are he hasn't been able to turn that into into a full time ride so far. Um, but yeah, I agree. He did. He turned it. He turned a difficult year into into some great opportunities. But of course, you always want more as a rider, and he wants more stability, more financial stability. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I guess that pressure will be playing on his mind at the moment, and that is definitely making it hard for him to to show his his full potential. Uh, we all know what speed he has. He knows what speed he has. Um, mm -hmm. Just a matter of unleashing mm -hmm. it and and sustaining it. Yeah, and I think probably, you know, even though women may may deal, deal with it differently, I can remember Catherine Prum saying um, she never felt so much pressure in that second year when she was defending her title when she said, you know, I felt like I had a target on my back. Um, do, did you feel, you know, when, when you had that 100-point lead, Josh, you know, like, was there a point where you felt like this is mine to lose, so to speak? Um, yeah, how, well, how how do you deal with that sort of space? I was pretty fortunate at that point because everything was going so well. Um, that was actually, believe it or not, one of the easiest points of my career. <laughs> um, the hardest points was more um when i started to get my first factory ride and and the results came and then sustaining them at that point so from 2000 i got my first factory ride and then sustaining it through 2001 was was the harder point um and and i see that with a lot of riders when they do become successful the first year everything's fun and easy and the second year um you, if it doesn't quite go your way for whatever reason you start to question yourself and um yeah. and that happens to a lot of people at different at different points of their career and you start to question why did it work last year and it's not working this year mm. and there's a bad luck or have i done something different and quite often they'll start to try to replicate what they did previously to get those to get that form um quite often it can come down to just simple things and yeah i'm a pretty simple person and i think that that um helped me uh, definitely in my career to just simplify it and try to make um, good decisions at the right time and and of course work ethic and um, 
but mm. I definitely could have believed in myself more as more. Um, but overall, I was I was fairly fortunate, and believe it or not, um, I know this doesn't really bode well for what we're talking about tonight. But that 2007 point was actually one of the easiest years of my career. Everything just up until the injury, um, I I felt like. And this comes back to the mental space. I felt like I could win at any time on any track. Yeah. And I was actually targeting tracks that I wanted to win at. So unfortunately, I got injured before uh, Namur and Lerop, But they were two tracks that I really wanted to win um, to win at. So I, I, had, I had a pretty clear um, plan. But I, I need to stress that you don't get many years like that in your career. No. Yeah don't get yeah. too many races like that some some guys are fortunate to get more but uh i didn't get too many but that was a that was a pretty unique situation mm. yeah i i'm you know i'm thinking now of avalon biddle um she she won the junior cup um twice over over in europe and then different circumstances josh you know donna decided well we don't actually need a, a woman's junior cup anymore and um so you know what what does it what does a rider do then? Um, and and similar has happened to Jordan Jarvis over in America. Um, you know the woman MX series was run in conjunction with the outdoors, and and then no longer in, from two thousand and eighteen. Do you do you think that those situations are a test on perhaps your resilience, Josh? To to rise above anything that's like that's a major obstacle yeah so i think um i think probably once that decision's made you need to change your mindset and not dwell on the fact that that's not going to happen or mm -hmm. you know the, no, that that not sort of think about the past and what how good it was or mm -hmm. um try and dwell on it and, and almost try to resurrect it, so to speak. I think you need to sort of turn the page and move on. And if sure, you're going to be disappointed. I understand that. But yeah, once that sure. decision's made, you've got to really move on and start to focus on what's next for you, um, how that championship's going to shape up, um, rather than dwell on it because there's no there's no there's no future in that, and it's not going to help you. It's not going to bode well for your career. So yeah. um, I think you need to be strong and understand sit down with good people around you make some good yeah. clear decisions on yeah. the direction that's going to be best for you as a rider um talk about your weaknesses and i talk about this a lot when i'm coaching and you know anyone that's done any coaching with me will remember me from saying this all the time as a motorcycle racer we tend to just ride and when it goes well it goes well and when it goes bad it goes bad and you start to question it but uh, i i think we need to talk more about um, our riding or our results and how we're feeling with the crew and with the people around you to try to understand what's working for you and why it's working. For example, I talk about with the kids that I coach, if they go to play rugby, they have a coach, they have a structure and they have a drill. Yet with parents, when they go to the motocross track, they have a hoon and if the kids are happy, they put the bike on the trailer and away they go. Mm. Not at any point do they discuss where they were good, why, where they were bad and why, how they're going to develop their skills. And, um, and, and quite often, even in a coaching situation, you end up more so um, teaching the basics, but they're really, those basics... Um, I often encourage parents to listen to as well because they're pretty simple. Um, it's basic physics, really. Is there's no magic, there's no quick fix. So I think uh, you need to have um, to talk about it more and discuss it more as parents, as families, as your crew. It could be your mechanic, and I think that um, bodes well for no matter where you are in your career, how good or, how good or bad you are what championship you're doing if you have a major shift in your championship where it's no longer running or you need to change class or you've you've pointed out or you're too old for that class you need to turn that page discuss what's going to be best for you make a plan set your goals reset them and work towards them as soon as you start getting frustrated and thinking oh it was better last year because i had this and this and this you're not going to make the make the gains you need to make um you can be disappointed i get that but you have to turn the page and move forward pretty quick yeah well like that is a major um uh, that's a major point josh because you know when you look at 
at all. I know of a little fella who, you know, like seriously could not get the the grip of shifting up gears. And you know, the little fella goes goes home dejected because he just he just can't get it. And yet at no no point at that whole trial and error process were people brought together, mum and dad or um or the coach at the time discussing the why, um, and if and if I look back, uh, you know, nationals long gone, you know, something didn't go to plan, and and you know, the rider ended up chucking the boots on the trailer and sitting there and shutting the door and don't want to see nobody. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So I guess probably you know a couple of key things I've touched on there is communication and. Yeah. Uh, and and having a plan and that worked well for me you know um when you're just running through the motions and you know you're not really getting the best out of yourself um and yeah i'm a goal person i'm driven by um and and i understand that people listening or and, and other writers everyone's different but if mm -hmm. i have a goal and a plan i feel like i'm achieving little steps and i'm all and quite often i'll mention this in coaching is short-term goal medium-term goal and long-term goal um is really important and it doesn't matter that what level you know if it could be world championship level or it could be local club level um it's important to to have that and because you need to have those little wins those little wins create mm. confidence which can create big wins um and and i think this is a is how it should be no matter uh what level you're at or or at what sport or even in life those same sorts of things you need to, i mean mm. i'm only talking off my own experience but those things um and i understand it's maybe was a little bit easier for me because i was quite a strong-minded person or still am so um if i believe in something i'll give it 100 percent, and i don't mm. i don't tend to get um distracted but at the same time, I need that plan and structure in order to achieve. Otherwise, otherwise, it, it, it gets hard. Yeah. So, like management, uh, communication aside, sometimes emotions can override the best, well play, placed plans. Josh, I mean, you've got adrenaline. You know, it, it, it's a difficult um scenario to factor in through rational thinking sometimes because there's just so much emotion that is taking place especially at you know at world level um did you ever feel josh that emotions were overriding rationality of thought the only time i had that was um towards the end of my career and again it was about life after racing it wasn't the actual racing itself i was pretty fortunate in the racing that i felt like i had a handle on things i'd already got a, a hell of a lot further than i ever expected to get you know i wasn't the most talented mm -hmm. rider i just i got to where i got just through hard work and and uh perseverance to be honest so um yeah and i got pretty fortunate you know i was able to race at some um at a high level and 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 i was very fortunate on financial level as well and so um i sort of come probably accustomed to a wee bit of a lifestyle i guess and mm. and um life after racing at that point was a pretty scary moment um understanding what you're going to do next you're no longer um josh the racer you're now you're now just josh and 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 how are you going to deal with that in that transition i was very 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 organized in that um in that aspect and it was still hard and I, a lot of my competition um i see that weren't organized and i was also fortunate that it wasn't an injury that's that that m made that shift for me really quick i was i was that would be extra hard as well um so yeah and and as i said i was pretty organized but i still think it was the, the emotion of that was quite high i'd lived in europe for 15 years i was coming home um you know there was personal um personal situation around me that that um didn't that had influence on that as well so uh that's probably the only time and looking back on it now i needed to probably slow everything down a little bit remove myself from from racing take some time and mm -hmm. talk with the right people 
but everything had gone at a million miles an hour in my life and that next decision was going at a million miles an hour as well and that wasn't the right thing that was definitely um i needed to slow it down and take the time and work through it a bit more steady okay so that josh that would be some advice i mean like leading on to the that question of mentally how do you deal with you're a racer in your last gp race and then it's end of season which you've already been accustomed to for 15 odd years anyway but then there's no restart in in february march there's no pre-season training like yeah. do you really really fall flat josh and and you think how yeah well i was probably you know i knew that was gonna that it was coming so i i sort of planned to do australia for two years as a stepping yeah. down exercise yeah. australia new zealand and that helped because it wasn't as it wasn't the same money it wasn't as much pressure it wasn't as quite as yeah. although it was still very very good and i still really enjoyed it and it was still professional it was a step down and it transitioned yeah. me into yeah. normality um i actually really enjoyed it it was um and obviously prior what actually happened was i knew my time at factory yamaha was coming up and uh they needed to move on they were super they treated me really well and mm. i wanted to come back to australia to ride for yamaha and they had both riders on two-year contracts so i had to wait my turn and then the aprilia situation came up as a test rider so i took that and 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 waited and then had my um opportunity come up with yamaha australia new zealand and i mean that's obviously we've seen what i'm now doing with yamaha it was all planned and there was a lot of a lot of thought mm -hmm. hey we never knew it was going to work out but there no. was a plan there and yeah. um and it was still hard you know i was it was still it was still tough um but that definitely helped um and it definitely allowed me to transition from factory team to a um state team um down to new zealand and then finally into my next phase of uh, of my career yeah so i mean you were obviously well aware of you know one side of the track to the other side of the track wasn't going to be easy at all and um you factored in that you know mentally i'm not going to be um left sit sitting hanging dry so to speak um yeah, no, you, I definitely planned for that, and, yeah. and I, um, and I think that's probably advice I'd give to anyone. You know, just be organised and and um, what wherever you finish up uh, with whatever teams or manufacturers, always end on good terms because it's a small world, you know. And and um, I was fortunate enough to have all that plan and able to phase into the next stage. Um, and yeah it, it all ran pretty smoothly and i knew exactly exactly what i was trying to do and like i said it was still hard because um i had been fortunate um and and it was still it was a new life um yeah. but but i think having a plan and and taking my time definitely helped yeah did you at, ever, at any stage josh within that transition period and also you know slotting over to racing in australia did you feel like this is not me uh not not with my racing um i had a obviously most people know my kids live in the uk so um mm -hmm. i separated from my partner at that time around 2011 so we moved back from europe in 2010 and my kids and her only lasted here about six months so that was the that was for me much harder than mm. the racing the race i had a plan i knew i always yeah. knew i was coming back yeah. to new zealand and then i didn't have control of that so that no. was probably the hardest part for me when i wasn't in control of what what was happening and what was going to happen mm. so um um probably that was the hardest part uh for me and mentally i guess uh, um and 
that was the only time I felt like, what the hell am I doing? You know, there was probably yeah. Yeah. probably about six to 12 months and I'm pretty private and, you know, I kept it all to my, to myself. I didn't even, I didn't let um, my team know in Australia or anything like that. I just sort of kept my head down. Um, and in between rounds, when there was gaps, I was flying back to Europe to sort of work out what I was going to do. At that point, I, mm. I was, I had a plan to start JCR and to do what I'm doing now. And yeah. I was thinking, do I just chuck all this in and move back to the UK and settle there? Uh, finally, finally, I decided to stick to what I thought would be best for everybody, and that was to stay in New Zealand. Um, I think I made the right decision. But, um, you know, I'm still obviously back there a lot to see the kids. But um, it was definitely – that was probably the, the hardest out of anything yeah. I've done because, like I said, I didn't have control. As a racer, yeah. you have control in your training, you have control on the racetrack, yeah. you have control of yeah. your life. And you and if you make a mistake and, and, and crash, for example, you suffer the consequences. But in this case, it was out of my hands. So that was very, very hard for me to deal with. Um, and yeah, I'll be honest, I, I did, um, my sister actually convinced me to get some, um, counseling around that and around the decision mm. on what I was going to, going to do. Yeah. It didn't work for me. Um, I, I only had one session. I was pretty, pretty clear in my mind on, I was pretty stubborn and clear on, on what I was going to do. And, um, yeah, thankfully it worked out and, and it is mm. what it is. We're sort of seven years on from that now but so yeah to, to answer your question the only time i ever thought what the hell am i doing was that situation yeah, yeah. which um you know like you can't really not have a professional life without having a personal life a, 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 well it's not healthy anyway um no. but i think that that raises a question josh you know like how do you balance a professional life as a as a rider as a racer with with having a personal life um that's yeah, not look, easy yes. yeah definitely not easy um no. yeah i it's, think it, um, it, it depends on what level you're at you know um it depends uh, depends you know early on in your career when you're trying to build it up and yeah definitely yeah. very very um, if you're at the top of your career and you're fortunate enough to have a great contract and be in a fortunate position, then um, it's a little bit easier. Um, there's no doubt I didn't handle that very well. Um, um, but at the same at the same time, I mean, it is what it is. Um, mm -hmm. Another thing which was, and this was not an excuse from my side, but definitely... Definitely, I was very focused on what I was trying to achieve with my racing and that um, nothing got in the way of where I was trying to get to and how and my plans and my structure. And that, at times, was detrimental to what I was trying yeah. to, um, to my personal life. Yeah. But um, I think that probably, yeah, I probably I could have handled that, that, that a little bit better um and and timing wasn't quite quite right there but um and mm. saying that i don't have regrets i think um it is what it is and and i did what i thought was right at the right time and sometimes yeah. i did the wrong yeah yeah and i i mean you know all personal circumstances are different um and people handle situations differently you know i remember dk telling me you know sharon it, as a racer at the highest level, it's a selfish sport. You know, I, he, he said, I'm so, so focused on myself, which, um, fair comment. Um, yeah, but then, no, no doubt about that. You are very, very um, selfish. And then that's probably one of the harder parts to transition from that into normal life. Because mm. um, especially if you're at the, at the high end, I mean, everything's about you. Everyone's there to support yeah. you. Everyone's there yeah. doing stuff you but at the same time they expect those results um so that cut does come with a certain amount of pressure but then uh life after that is is sometimes difficult to understand or to accept and to to get used to that yeah. um so so yeah i think i mean honestly i keep talking about the same thing for me it come back to being organized understanding that keeping your feet on the ground um mm -hmm. you know sort of did full circle 
you know, I left school, worked as a motorcycle apprentice, um, went to Europe and then went right through that, managed to get quite far up and then came back. So I always, you know, I wasn't a wonder kid on a motorcycle that had all this talent that just went straight into the Grand Prix and dominated. I worked my butt off. And so I always kind of, and, and one way I was fortunate that I understood, you know, and I, and I kept my feet on the ground and I knew where I was from and, and I knew how hard, you know, what, how hard it was in the real world, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, uh, I did, I did come back and do full circle and sort of, settle okay back in New Zealand but it was still, yeah. still a little bit scary yeah for sure um so just kind of like just to sort of like round it up um I mean your your advice is worth gold Josh for sure I mean you know you you've been there you've you've achieved massive goals in your career and you've turned it around and 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 basically you know you've got such a a successful enterprise um, with JCR and and giving back as well um, for those for those riders young middle whatever um, who are not able to um, touch base with your with your coaching sessions Josh um, are there you know like some some uppermost thoughts in your mind if if these 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 riders are you know they want to chase some 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 goals and and often there's a, a you know there's just kind of like this tall poppy syndrome in New Zealand which you know like should really disappear <laughs> um you know everyone should believe in themselves surely you know I agree so um I guess probably first thing is again set your goals doesn't matter if you uh, club want to be a club champion uh, or you want to be a world champion um short term medium term long term um, get, get get try and get as best advice you can to prepare yourself physically, mentally. Um, prepare yourself as best you can with your training on the motorcycle, off the motorcycle. Um, structure around the event, the events you want to do, and just just basically work hard. Put your best foot forward. Make good decisions. Speak to your parents about it. Speak to good people or at the track that you trust. Um, keep that group small. You know, too much advice can be a bad thing. Keep it small. Yeah. Um, and and you're going to have bad days and you're going to have good days. And under, try to understand, don't just get frustrated and forget about the bad days. Try and understand why they were bad. How can I fix that? What did I do wrong? Um, what, what was different today than on my good days? And on your good days, pat yourself on the back, take that step forward and wake up the next day and, and work towards making the next step um it's not going to be easy and it doesn't it's not going to be easy no matter who you are or what you're trying to achieve just keep at it um and don't give up and i think uh, i honestly think that with the with the right mindset the right organization and um you know listen and 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 put those um initiatives into place and and you really got a good chance to be successful and and, in your chosen sport and then one thing i would add to that is if it's not your chosen sport that you're successful in and you do fall short of your goals those um attributes Mm -hmm. will help you in life after racing they will help you on business they will help you in family life they will help you Mm -hmm. those values those values you install into your into your training and 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 the people around you, those values will take you a long way in life. So you may not win at your chosen sport, but you will. Um, I think you have a very good chance of winning in life. So, and to me, that's probably more important. And in this yeah. motorcycle bubble, you your life becomes racing. And I had probably the longest career of almost anybody. You know, I was professional for 20 years, and and that's virtually unheard of. So, and there's a long life after racing. Um, and I recently um, sent a message to Gautier Paulan that just retired, mm. and I said, life starts now. And I was honest because, you know, you – life after racing was was at first scary but once i got into it it was it was pretty cool you know you miss out on a lot we talked about it you're very selfish so i guess what i'm saying is take make the most of every situation and enjoy it 
work with it, do the best you can, whether that's still in your racing career when, when racing is your life and, or whether that's this next step after life, after, sorry, life after racing or, mm. and, and um, be as organized as you can and, and be prepared. And uh, I guess probably that hardest part will be if it's an injury that stops your career suddenly or something happens that you quickly get thrown into the next phase then you need yeah. to seek support from friends, family, coaches, those people around you. And again, close people, not, you know, we can ask support from 20 different people and we're going to get 20 different answers, but it comes back mm. to the ones that you trust mm. and believe. In. Yeah. Wow. Well, it's brilliant. Yeah. Honestly, um, you've given such, um, you know, just focusing on the tools for anybody that needs to, take on board and um and and not not just in motocross so you know, it's a great sport it's great for well being and um many thanks for your time it's been a, it's been a great pleasure yep no worries uh, my pleasure and uh, um yeah um anytime and thanks for the opportunity and uh, yeah again. awesome cheers, cheers. Thank you.